you like that idea, love that idea so much because it has come from a forward view. To answer your question on the pattern, one thing that I do is to be also a critique of that idea. So you said you will find the seed of change embedded. The seed of the change that you see today, I would look for that. We need the haystack or try and find the needle. Hmm. That I think is the, is the skill that I would say you need. You would always find that there is something that you can do to change that for the better. Spirituality and science are not contradictory. At what point did you say, you know, this is where data ends and instinct begins? That intuition ultimately is stored the data of many things. Whenever you want to do that, make the change, it's very important that you have a deep understanding of all dimensions of that proposal you're going to make, which is again something very important for an entrepreneur. Welcome to another session of the Bulletproof Business Podcast at Zolvit. It's a pleasure, delight and honor to have Mr. R. Seshishai with us. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Thank you. My privilege. I look forward to this interaction. So, first of all, it's going to take me a few minutes to list out all the things that you have done. So, I'm going to take a few minutes to do that and that will lead me to my first question. You started off as a chartered accountant and I'll come to your... I'd like you to talk about your background, but the chartered accountancy was your degree, so to speak. But then you have donned so many different roles and worn so many different hats. Most famously, of course, as Managing Director of Ashok Leyland, then as Chairman of Infosys, then as President of the Society of Automobile Manufacturers Association of India, President of the CII, President of NIT Trichy, and then in social and philanthropic roles as the Head of the Cancer Institute, the Hinduja Hospital, the SCARF Institute, the founder of the Kriya University, uh, working with the Tamil Nadu government on primary education as one of the board of trustees of the Sri Rangam temple. I mean, the list goes on and on. So how did a chartered accountant really get to doing all of this? What was that root seed quality which made you be able to do all this? I think probably uh, I'm a bad chartered accountant. A good chartered accountant should not be straying from what he's doing. Um, it is just... Uh, the fact that I was very curious about the world around me. Anything that I came across stoked my curiosity to get to know more. And that led me to different paths. And therefore, I had to call out one very important lesson that I've learned during my life is that uh, it's necessary to continue to be learning no matter how old you are. Uh, no matter what uh, different subjects you are faced with, it doesn't matter that you haven't had a formal education, you haven't had a formal degree in accountancy or finance or engineering. So long as uh, you stumble on something which interests you and you want to know more about it, you're curious to know more about it, then I think you've got to get there because that curiosity helps you to learn. And once you learn, you would always find that there is something that you can do to change that for the better. When you hit that spot, that's when you begin to start adding value to your learning. And I think that's been my consistent learning right through. So, you said learning. So, how do you learn? What is your... Because today, you are in leadership roles in companies and in organizations. So, obviously, it's not the formal style of learning. So, are you learning through books? Are you seeking out new strains of thought, maybe on YouTube? How are you learning today? There are two parts to it. One is, of course, uh, you know, there is no particular prescribed way of learning. Of you course. learn from everybody. You learn from everyone that you come across in your life. You learn from situations. The situations that you are in, it could be a family situation. It could be a situation in your work, a situation around you, a political situation. Uh, so you're learning from each of this. And uh, when you learn, it's not, uh, it's not the right to stop only absorbing knowledge. That makes, uh, makes it incomplete. When that knowledge, when you acquire that knowledge, because you have a curiosity to learn and you get that knowledge, it's very important to give some thought to that, what you have learned. My mother was a very uh, well-known writer in Tamil. Uh, she was uh, 
she was i think uh, 11 when she got married and she had uh, uh, she had done studied only up to fifth, fifth class those days she taught herself uh, tamil and english and everything else and started writing and she was also a very prolific speaker and uh, when the you would and i would find her if she had to give a talk a public talk uh, uh, in, in the evening i find her uh, browsing some book in the afternoon which had nothing to do with what, what she was going to say and once i asked her said why do you want to be reading this book it has nothing to do with what you want to be talking in the evening and she said you know it doesn't matter what matters is that uh, if this stoke some curiosity in you to think about what uh, it says that will lead you to a thought which will be relevant to what i have to say this evening so knowledge comes from different kind of uh, uh, directions they come through different media uh, you got to process that knowledge you've got to observe that and think about it thinking is very important do you apply any pattern to thinking for example the six thinking hats do you apply any tools to help you think better i don't uh, consciously apply any tools but i think there is one thing which i have learned is very important and this might be very important to young entrepreneurs when you start an idea when you get a bright idea because you've learned about something and you then say ha ah, if i change that that will then give me a great uh, idea to develop a business of that i'm going to do that for example if you're saying that you know i'm going to use technology to be uh, enabling uh, companies to start uh, uh, operations or to conform to law and they form god apply this technology this is the change that i want to make when you think about that sometimes it is like falling in love you like that idea love that idea so much because it has come from a from out of you you get blindsided on all the defects of that idea so one thing that i to answer your question on the pattern one thing that i do is to be also a critic of that idea hmm In fact, uh, I recall that uh, when I was in Ashok Leyland, um, there was one particular gentleman uh, who was in the headquarters of the Hindu House in uh, London, and he was known for shooting down every idea. Uh, so I used to say that uh, we must make take this past this gentleman because he will tell you all that can go wrong with this. Correct. Why it will not succeed? Correct. but it listening to that is very important because we become so attached to our idea the beauty for idea it's so enthralling and you fall in love with that idea you don't want to hear anything negative correct and it is important to just have that ear uh, which is very objective kind of a process right you almost, it almost becomes like an attack on you as a person yeah. if someone attacks an idea absolutely. you're in love with absolutely absolutely yeah yeah I, I, and you want to brush that aside because it can't happen. And in fact, you feel angry with the person who is attacking your idea. Exactly, but I think this is a very important lesson. Unless you have got the space in your mind to listen to people who are going to be critical of your ideas dispassionately, dispassionately, you are yeah. never going to get it right. Because if you don't listen to them, you are going to get that idea coming up in real terms in the marketplace. It's better to simulate that and understand. One thing which you have said many times, which really resonates with me, and it will help our viewers as well, is when you talk about an idea, look at the change which you want to see in the world, right, and work right. backwards from the change. Absolutely. So, can you maybe walk us through an incident or two where you had an idea? Obviously, it was close to your heart, but then you really took the lens of this is the change which I want to make in the world around me, and use that as a prism through which you sort of viewed the idea. You know, uh, I'll talk about the idea which uh, which. Uh, which enabled me to think about a big change but where i failed okay i want to talk about that uh, you know this is probably in 2000 and i was doing a lot of uh, travel around the truck centers what strikes you is the fact that you got in every truck center you got a broker somebody who wants to ship some goods from let's say kolkata to chennai uh, there is a broker who will be sitting for getting all the goods which are coming out from uh, the various manufacturers which are intended to go to from calcutta to chennai. chennai so there'll be a broker there and 
there will be a lot of lorry owners and truck drivers who would come to this guy to say, I want to go to Chennai. Now, what is the uh, freight that's available? The broker will do this business of matchmaking, right, between the shipper who wants to send stuff to Chennai and the truck owner or the truck driver who wants to take it there. And he will do this job. Correct. And I said, why do we need this kind, kind of a broker at all? Why can't we use just technology to do that? This is 2000. Uber was not even uh, there, right? Yeah. There was no, there was no mobile phone penetration. But I said, no, let's put a kiosk there, uh, put a computer uh, in each of this kiosk, and we'll do the matchmaking there. We'll get the, all the shippers to come on, online, and we'll get the, the uh, lorry drivers to uh, log in there. Since they won't know how to log in, we'll have the instead of the broker, we'll have somebody who will log in. And so there'll be a discovery in terms of the best prices, right? Which is the best load, best price, and so on. Now, I wanted to change this entire uh, marketplace by doing this. We call that the transport exchange. I went ahead with that for about six years or so. Uh, we opened some 140 kiosks around in truck centers, but a guy who would have a, a computer in front and who would, instead of the broker, the, the, the lorry drivers would come to him and he would log in uh, that these are the lorry drivers who are available to take the stuff. And you will have shippers who are sitting in their offices who would log in to say, I've got this kind of a cargo to be taken to Chennai and he'll make the uh, match. mechanic match. But I failed in that. I failed in that because I had not sufficiently understood the complexities of this problem. But to me, that is a big, it would have been a big game, game changer. If I did not, uh, if I had not started this without really understanding the change that I wanted to bring about, it would not have got started. I wanted to bring the change. But what it also means is that whenever you want to do that, make the change, it's very important that you have a deep understanding of all dimensions of that proposal you're going to make, which is again something very important for an entrepreneur. Mm. The deep knowledge of what you want to do to change. First, the baseline, deep knowledge of the asset situation. And then the, a very deep knowledge of what the change that you want to make and a very deep knowledge of what impact that this will bring about in the asset situation, right? All the risks that will come about as a result of this uh, change, all of that you need to have a deep understanding. You need, you need to have a deep understanding of the mind of every stakeholder, the mind of a customer, the mind of a supplier, the mind of someone who is going to be funding you. I think all these are very, very critical parts. How do you balance this, which clearly sounds very logical when you say it, to the realities of business? For example, to know the mind of that local guy who was the intermediary at the mandi or wherever the wherever the goods were transferred from the, uh, you know, the manufacturers to the truck owners and truck operators. The mind of the guy, he was clearly rent, see, he was clearly somebody who was sort of controlling that exchange. Correct. Right? And it was his vested interest to ensure that it never slipped out of his hands because that was their source of income. So when you say this, right, sometimes don't you need to make a leap into the unknown where you don't know what you don't know, but you make your peace with it and say, I don't know this, but I'm going to try it anyway. Your, is your approach maybe a, trying to tie too many knots before you it's get a, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. Future is always unknown. Yeah. Right? Clearly, you are uh, leaping into something which is a totally uncharted territory. Right. When you make this change happen, the future is going to look different. It's yeah. not linear. With the change, it is going to be something different. Yeah. Right? So, how can you possibly understand the future? There are two answers to this question. One is that it's important, therefore, to know what is it that you are currently faced with in terms of the assets, the reality situation today, mm -hmm. right? And if you know deep enough about the current situation, you will find, and I say this categorically, you will find that seed of change somewhere already embedded. That's what is going to create the future. If you look deep enough, future is present in the present in a small seed. There is a spark that's going to become a fire in the future. Now, if you don't deep enough about what the current market situation is, you'll have somebody 
who is acting differently and you know that that person who is acting differently that customer who is looking for something different now is going to really inspire many other people and the market will change to something different tomorrow and i want to catch that so it is the knowledge of the current situation and look for that one one change that is happening it's a spark but you got to be very very conscious of that spark then you can catch it i really want to probe deeper because this is really what entrepreneurship is about uh, so you said you will find the seed of change embedded in the as is situation when you when you when, so you look at an as is situation you define it very clearly and then you say this is the change i want to bring in and in the gap between the as is and the vision you have for the intended future which you want to bring you will see a seed of change embedded in the as is itself right and that is a seed of change you want to actually water and you know let it take root okay. can you maybe walk us through one situation uh, you spoke about the mandi situation the truck uh, exchange which didn't work but in your decades of experience in so many different industries can you walk us through maybe one situation uh, where you saw an as a situation you saw a seed of change embedded in it when you know by the force of your you're clearly someone who has a lot of i would say latent uh, you come across as someone very calm but i can sense a sense a, a sort of latent fieriness right in the way you are even answering the question so you used your force of personality to make that change happen can you maybe walk us through one of those scenarios in the early days and i go back to uh, times which you can't even relate because the, sure. you know india has changed so much yeah right? uh, in the olden days a truck financier was somebody who sat in a small shop right uh, he asked for usurious interest rates and he, he is a private financier uh, who would give uh, uh, funding for a truck uh literally on the basis that he can threaten the truck driver or the truck owner to make uh, payments repayments he knew nothing about the truck running but he was a financier he was a hardcore private financier but you saw that somebody amongst this financial uh, financial community somebody saying i don't want to be doing that i want to go behind a truck and make sure that the truck driver earns enough make him competitive so there is one guy who is sitting in fact i came across that kind of a person uh, of all places in bihar uh, that time bihar was i am talking about the 80s uh, and this is that far back there is not a place where you could go and do financing because uh, people will simply not uh, repay hmm. they will come and uh, point a gun at you if you are going to ask for a repayment right yeah but there was somebody uh, there was one guy uh, he was actually quite a uh, quite an old person he was uh, past 60 he had become very friendly with the truck uh, owners there single truck operators and uh, when i went to see him i was surprised that he was sitting along with uh, 10 truck uh, drivers or truck owners the owner drivers uh having his uh, chai and he was deeply in conversation with these people to understand their business and he was giving them ideas about how to improve their viability how to get better freight rates how to bargain how to stop a bad customer he was giving all this information and he was only an exchange of ideas right he was absorbing from them processing it and giving it back to them right and i came back and said that we want to start a company a finance company at that time ashokalin was a foreign company and they were not allowed to go into financing those were licensed days so not allowed to go into financing uh but i said no there is a need for a knowledgeable financier somebody who is going to be able to make an assessment whether this particular truck is the right kind of a truck for the kind of freight that you want to carry is this person turning the or maintaining his vehicles properly so it doesn't pack up and then create a problem for him and for the financier is the maintenance schedule correctly done is this is he the kind of a person who's going to drive carefully and make sure that he doesn't get into an accident none of this was a part of the the processing that a typical private financier was doing was doing right but i said no here's an opportunity if this guy can do this successfully 
if I institutionalize this and start a finance company, which can bring all this, all this knowledge, which is gathered from the various stakeholders to benefit the customers, and the, which, which eventually will also benefit me as a financier, why not do that? So we started a company, which is a very successful company, which I merged it later on with uh, Industrial Bank. It's called Ashok Lane Finance uh, Company. The inspiration for that uh, company came from this chance meeting that I had with uh, this guy in the city in Patna. So there is a there is somebody who is making something which is interesting, and he said, "How can I scale this up? How can I improve this? How can I make therefore a change, which will then which will then design the future?" That I think is an important. Just taking a step back here, right? So you said curiosity, you said learning, you said then looking for that seed of change, uh, you know, and... Remember, you know, genetic evolution takes place over very long periods of time, right? There is some mutation taking place in very small bits. Correct. Right? If you know what is the kind of mutation that is taking place, we catch that. You can actually predict what the genetic mutation is going to lead up to. Got it. Right? It is, it is uh, genetic evolution takes place at glacial speed. It's very, very slow. There are many things which happen very fast. Today's condition, if you take, you you look at uh, the changes that are happening in technology, AI, for example, right? Everybody is talking about AI. Everybody knows it's going to make a change. AI certainly will be impact. I don't know what impact it's going to make, but I know it's going to make an impact. The future is uncertain. In what form and shape the AI will take and how will it impact, I don't know. But if you look around carefully, something is already working somewhere. Correct. Right? And if I can just put my finger on that, if I learn deeply enough, if I'm curious to know, if I'm curious to know about AI, and if I get to know what AI is, where currently ChatGPT is getting deployed, who's using ChatGPT for what purpose. And if I spot and that there is somebody who's making very viable use of this, Chat GPT for a particular uh, uh, solution for a particular problem. And if I sit back and say, what can I do to scale that up? How can I define the problem differently and make a business out of that? Business will be formed and you will make, a, you will design the future. That I think is what is critical. So just you know, in, in terms of all of the things you have seen, I want to actually quiz you on the India that you have seen in the past because for a lot of us, mm -hmm. we had, we don't have any perspective, right? Uh, sitting today with, uh, I mean, I think we are quite blessed to be oh, building businesses in this era versus that era. Absolutely. Uh, and I think you've seen probably the most tough, most harsh economic environments right. which right. any Indian had the fortune or misfortune to see. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. I think I'll, for a lot of I'll, us... I'll, I'll, I'll take that right away. Okay. I started my career in Hindustan Lever. And then, uh, that was in 71. Uh, At that point of time, you had uh, uh, what is called a comptometer. Okay. And you had Comptus. Who would, the comptometer uh, is, a, is now an ancient thing. And I don't think you can even find this in any museum now. Uh, but you've got to punch those the, uh, keys on the comptometer for additions, right? And then in 74, I think, um, you had the first calculator. And then uh, people said, wow, I mean, this calculator can do the job of this battery of computers who are punching and pounding on this computer, trying to make additions of all the invoices. Uh, but we had resistance from all over, right? And you had to write a financial capital approval proposal for getting a, a one calculator, right? <laughs> Fast forward uh, in 1981, uh, IBM had this uh, hardware, uh, this mainframe machine called 1401. Mm -hmm. If you know the history of computers, 1401 is one of those. I think uh, you should maybe spend a minute telling our viewers right. about 1401 because yeah, maybe some geeks is, uh, have read about it. It's a mainframe and people today don't even know what mainframe computer is yeah. because of your distributed systems. You carry everything in your, uh, in your hand device. Uh, so mainframe computers uh, was something which was, uh, which occupied a huge space and you had uh, uh, you you had punch cards uh, which needed to be fed into the machine for uh, computations. Uh, and for getting that 1401 one machine, uh, we had to get a license. And I had to go to Delhi, uh, I think four or five times, to convince the ministry 
that I want to import this 1401. And then the question was, but why do you want a tape drive and a disk drive? I had to explain to them why I needed both. That was a kind of environment. And I think we sold some 200 vehicles in Zambia. And we wanted to send a service engineer to look after the 200 vehicles in Zambia, uh, who was to be paid uh, $200 per month. The Reserve Bank could not allow me to pay $200. They said, no, why does he need $200 for service engineer for looking after 200 vehicles? Why does he need $200? We need to, to get approval from the Reserve Bank. And then they said, but you know, Tata Motors sold uh, some 300 vehicles in Upper Volta, 100 vehicles in Upper Volta, and we gave only $180. Why would you want $200? So you had a lot of these obstacles which you had to get over to do business. There was a time when uh, we had a license for, uh, I remember that, for uh, 1,560 industrial engines. We also used to make industrial engines for gen sets. Uh, there's a long queue because there's a power shortage. There's a long queue of people who are waiting to get this industrial engines. But we are licensed to do only 1,560. <clears throat> you could exceed that by 15%, but no more. We exceeded that by about 22%. And we were summoned to Delhi and I went to Delhi to explain why I had to do this because there were people waiting and I had to honor some of the commitments. And we were penalized for producing in excess of the license capacity to feed a market which is starving for lack of power generation and therefore production was getting uh, affected. We were in that kind of situation. So we've come a long way in this 40 years, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But having said that, you know, Today's market, if you think this is going, is an easier market than the, the market earlier, that's not true. The complexities have changed. The kind of issues that you had to deal with as an entrepreneur 50 years ago was different to the ones that were faced 20 years ago. Very different now and it will be vastly different in the next 10, 15 years. How so do you feel? Because the amplitude of change is getting to be higher. It's going up and down much, much more than what we have been used to. Right? It's market, whether it is a stock market or whether it is an exchange market, foreign exchange, uh, the demand, uh, supply situation, and the technology, all of that are going through very, very... The big, cycles have become shorter is what you're saying. The cycles have become shorter. The amplitude of change has become much higher. So the crest and the trough has become sh higher, higher and the cycle has become shorter. Correct. Therefore, it's pretty much more difficult for you to have a prognosis of the future now. It's much more uncertain than in a situation where things did not change that much because there were so many obstacles, you could not change. So you could predict what will happen in 10 years time. If business were a sport, what sport would it, would it be in your mind? Business were a sport? Yeah. If, uh, in current day situation, it's very different than to... Okay, yeah. So maybe that's... That my, I'll change my question. Yeah. If business was a sport, what sport would it be in 1971 when you started? In 1990 when the economy changed? And today in 2023, 24? You know, in 71, I would say it's definitely it's a chess, right? Chess, okay. Uh, because you were fighting with somebody. You were fighting with yourself, actually, quite often. The government is fighting with you. You are fighting with the government. So very adversarial. Very adversarial, right? That's completely changed. Now... If I were to look at the sport today, I would say that you you it's more like football, right? You can of course predict, but you can't predict all the way how the ball is going to be kicked around, right? So it's not going to be that easy for you to uh, to score a goal because new techniques are being discovered in the field as you go along. So you have played the game in the chess era. And also in the football, you continue to play the game in the football era, right? And your approach is to look for that seed of change and really pursue that seed of change and make it happen. But what gives you the courage to see it through? Because as I listed when we started, for those of you who uh, are tuning in now, I'll just repeat maybe for emphasis all the things that you have done. So you were the CEO, the MD, the Managing Director of Ashok Leyland, then the Chairman of Infosys, the President of CII, and of NIT Trichy and of the Chess Society of Automobile Manufacturers Association of India and then in multiple philanthropic organizations starting universities so in each of these you clearly saw a seed and you pursued that seed until that seed took root and then eventually gave fruit what allowed you 
apart from curiosity, which we spend some time on, to really persevere and see it through? Passion. I think if uh, you believe that a change is going to make an impact, and if you believe in the change, and if you know enough about the change, enough about the the situation today and the change that is likely to make the situation different, and you can envision that new situation deeply enough for you to know, then you get very excited about the future that you're going to be uh, developing. And that is the energy that you get to make the change happen. So you really But I think, I, I, I think that that is a part of a continuum. This, it starts with the curiosity and I cannot get away from curiosity. Uh, you know, I, I, you talked about uh, various things I've done. Uh, in fact, I've, I've had uh, experience in a number of industries, uh, specialty chemicals, uh, chair board uh, today, which is Asian paints, um, in, in chemicals, uh, in, I've been in uh, power generation, in finance, been in banks. One thing that uh, I've always been inspired by is one person that I've been inspired by is Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Leonardo da Vinci, as you know, was a master uh, sculptor, a painter, an extraordinary scientist. I mean, cool. Some of the some of the some of the uh, uh, stuff that he had created in terms of looking at the future of uh, uh, equipments and future of science, uh, amazing. How did you do all of that? I mean, if I say, well, look at myself, I'm really nothing in comparison to someone like Leonardo da Vinci who could do that. Somebody who could say, uh, who could command the future of science and, and, and bring the aesthetics of uh, art simultaneously. All that happens because there is a thirst for knowledge. And if you want to know Deep enough, you got enough time. One of the things that I don't uh, at all agree is that I, people saying I don't have time. You will have time <laughs> when you want to do something. Badly enough. Badly enough. You will have time. But you, and I'm going to take a slight deviation here because you also happen to be, uh, if I'm correct, uh, one of the board of trustees of the Sri Rangam temple. And you are known to have an interest in things spiritual. So does, this, does your spiritual side in any way help your ability to, because if I may say so, I think you have lived many lives in the few in the few decades. Like people, what you have done in, in a few decades is what I think an, an army of people who do their entire life individually, right? Collectively, you have done it in maybe a few short decades. So what has, and you said you attributed to curiosity and passion, but is there something that we are missing? Like uh, you clearly have a spiritual bent. Does that spiritual bent in any way help or feed your passion? And if yes, how does it feed that passion? You know, uh, my journey is in the in, this, in my spiritual quest has been also been uh, somewhat uh, non-linear. Okay, uh, I've been uh, to some extent in the initial stages, but like uh, everybody else, you get indoctrinated by the faith that you are born into, born into, into, and therefore you believe everything. And there is a there is a certain stage in life when you begin to question: Is this correct? I mean, why am I believing all this being said? Correct. What is it that's going to do to me? Uh, and then you begin to question. Uh, and there's a time when you have the curiosity to learn more about science, and mm. then you begin to say, you know, are these two different things completely, or do they converge somewhere, or do they oppose each other? Is spirituality and science are contradictory? You begin to start thinking about that. My own quest took me to uh, to a route where I found that spirituality and science are not contradictory. But to say that uh, science has proved everything uh, about spirituality is equally wrong. But I find that the direction is very similar. What science does is to discover about ourselves about the universe that we live in, about our relationship between ourselves and the rest of the universe. In so doing, you are trying to figure out those connections in, in a non-physical way. Physics, when you start moving in that direction, 
Today, we, we've gone, we've gone through the Newtonian and then the, we had the Einstein and then we had the quantum. When you begin to say superposition in a quantum, exactly right, then you begin to say, ha, huh, that sounds somewhat similar to what spiritually this has been, uh, been uh, described. They're not the same. But if, I mean, I, I like this uh, uh, one particular song of uh, Kannadasan. Uh, which says that uh, uh, Kanandasan as well as Bharatiya, uh, who both of whom are great, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of both. Bharatiya says in one of the uh, uh, epic poems, he says, you know, there, there was this sculptor who took one piece of stone and put that as the, as the step in the temple and he took another piece of stone and made it into an idol. One god worshipped as an idol, and the other, you stepped on that. It's the same guy, same stone. So, Kanadasan says that if you want to look at the stone as a stone, it is a stone. If you want to look at the idol as, a, as God, it is God. It's up to you, right? Which is what science is moving towards saying that things don't exist unless the observer is there. I mean, this famous Schrodinger cat, I don't know. If yeah, yeah, about Schrodinger of cat. There's, I mean, if, if there's no observer, there is no cat. If there's no observer, there's no observed. Now you begin to say, ah, so they're saying the same things in different ways. They're not the same, quite, but they're moving in the same direction. Yeah. So therefore, you begin to get curious about, to see, is there, is there any contradiction? So that's been my question in the, in the process of understanding spirituality. But has that, because you mentioned, you know, quantum physics, uh, you mentioned the Schrodinger's cat experiment. Uh, you also sort of hinted at the Heisenberg un uncertainty principle and superposition Correct. as being so basically a, a particle is in multiple places at Correct. once Correct. and both as a wave and as a particle until Correct. the observer comes Correct. and appears to place the particle in a specific position Correct. right so a particle is literally everywhere and nowhere at once Correct. exactly and can be in both places and can be it, it is in both, both places, places. Right. so where it is is just a matter of observation that causes it to appear to be there Correct. Correct. right exactly uh, so now this is deeply spiritual because deeply that spiritual. is that is what the bhagavad gita says that is what other faiths also so every spiritual faith is in in some sense a scientific work right may be played out or made to appear like a spiritual doctrine to make it easier for people to digest. Do you believe that? I believe that uh, uh, a lot of religion is metaphor. Okay. Spirituality is not necessarily, you know, made to believe. Spirituality is, uh, I mean, the, the, small, the spiritual masters uh, have said it as they, as they intuitively felt, right? Uh, religion is a lot of metaphor. But the metaphor the the what religion carries is spirituality. So yes. religion maybe the is the pipe, the, yeah. and the the water is spirituality, yeah. right? Or how has that helped you in your in your journey? So how has your faith, how has your uh, deep spirituality helped you, especially with the tough times? Has it helped? And if yes, how has it helped? I don't know whether I can answer this honestly, uh, okay. because uh, uh, I have uh, uh, tried to isolate myself from uh, a crisis if it i've not personalized a crisis i've tried to stay away from the crisis and look at a crisis as dispassionately as i can to see what's the solution for that whether that comes out of that detachment comes out of spirituality i'm not sure i don't know uh, i haven't found an answer i asked this question to myself i don't know the answer uh, maybe it has maybe it is not i don't know uh, but I certainly have found one thing that we want to solve a problem in the uh, a pro problem or a crisis. The first step that you have to take is to come out of that and take a view of that from outside the crisis, not being part of that and then getting to see that. Because you can never get a clear vision of the crisis if you're a part of that. You've got to come out of that. So like Einstein said, you know, you have to solve the problem only if you get to a higher level of consciousness than the one which created the absolutely, problem. Absolutely, absolutely. So Exactly that. I think you put it very, very well. That's exactly what it is. So how do you rise to that higher level of, because just listing out what you've done, you've had multiple maybe step functions, I would say, of rising to higher and higher levels of consciousness. And what was... Oh, what was it conscious that you rose to a higher level of consciousness? You took a deliberate call 
or was it just the circumstance and the and the need of the award which pro propelled you to that higher level? The latter, I think. Okay. The latter, certainly not the former. It's the latter. Tell us a little bit about. So you have started fourteen different companies or organizations inside uh, Ashok Leyland and the Hinduja Group. Right. So you've worn the hat of an entrepreneur and a manager both at very senior as a manager at very senior levels and as an entrepreneur obviously every day is day one so what would you say is is there a dividing line first of all between being an entrepreneur and a manager and what are the best practices of entrepreneurs that a manager should remember and the best practices of a good manager that an entrepreneur would you know do well to keep in mind if you take two extreme situations i mean uh, you have the army which is very regimented, right? You have to follow rules. You have to wear your uniform. You have to make sure that you salute your uh, boss. And you operate by the rules. There is no, there is not much scope for creativity. You can't get a soldier to think creatively, yeah. right? I mean, if he's got, if he's told to shoot, he's got to shoot. Period, right? I mean, there's not much of creative thing that he can do to shoot, right? And it goes all the way. Why is that necessary? Because uh, you need that structure and the rigidity of that structure to get the best out of uh, the, the resources that you have. Take the other extreme of an artist. The artist who writes a poem or composes a song uh, doesn't work within grammar. Not doesn't necessarily have to work within a grammar. Of course, there are grammar requirements of grammar for poetry. There is grammar for music and so on and so forth. But a true creative artist can break all the shackles and, and completely ignore grammar and create something beautiful. We have seen this repeatedly happening. Now, both of them, in their own respective way, are contributing, uh, contributing to a particular change. A cha in, the, in, the, in the case of a creative artist, in terms of change of uh, your mood uh, as a listener, yeah, uh, and and uh, a change that might happen in the case of a soldier in terms of making the changes happen between your uh, enemy and yourself in terms of the control of power. So there is some some outcomes coming out of that. Now in an organization, you got to be a mix of both. You've got to have the the necessary framework and the necessary regimen of a, an army, and yet provide creative spirits. Correct. Right? Now you have this very famous thing where you had this, uh, you know, Sony. Uh, uh, I think Akio Morita uh, used to say that I'll give you the dimension of uh, uh, what is it called in uh, Sony of this Walkman. Walkman. I'll give you the the Walkman dimension. I'll tell you the cost and I'll tell you what the outcome should be. Go on, invent. Yeah. But you also have inventions taking place in a completely laser fair situation. Model, yeah. You, you can take the Xerox Park, where you had all this technology breakthroughs that happened. Open AI or something like that. Which exactly. This, right? Now, an organization has to find that balance. Hmm. In which stage of its evolution is it in? What is the necessity uh, at this stage uh, of this evolution, the context of the market that it serves? How much of creative uh, energies do we need to promote and how much do we need to bound that energy with uh, some framework so that there is order. And that is not a line that is going to be static. It's a constantly moving line. It will change with people, it will change with the context, it will change with the business. Yeah. Now, very successful person makes sure that that balance is correctly uh, struck. Right? That, I think, is, the, again, the lesson that I have learned is that you can't apply just one type of approach and one type of framework uh, across. You need to judge the situation. You need to judge the people who have gathered and their dynamics and where they are positioned and their, their, their own attitude and the mental space they have for creativity and uh, for uh, adherence to rules and laws. And where is the desired uh, outcome. position? Outcome. But... Along all of this, and the reason I'm sort of coming back to this again and again is I'm trying to find the source of your inspiration. So, what 
because all of this requires rapid decision making right you are obviously going did you did looking back did you go a lot with what at a gut level felt right uh, how much at what point did you say you know this is where data ends and instinct begins uh, i i don't know what i'm actually looking to ask you but what i'm trying to get to is how did you arrive at how did you make and a lot of your decisions clearly were successful right so what was the where did data and instinct or gut begin uh, did you first hear your gut then look for some data and then again go back to gut or was it so was it gut data gut actually uh, this is problematic for me saying okay. data is something different and uh, gut is different gut is different i think it's problematic for me i think it's what is important uh, is really to no as i said i go back to what i said and sometimes i have to repeat myself because it's so uh, so elementary uh, you have to know the the current uh, situation very thoroughly and that's all data because the data is about past future is not data right you have all the data of the present that data will move you to a particular direction understood right? that's the future so therefore everything is data but what you feel the gut or the intuition has to happen sometimes when you have inadequate data when data is don't quite add up you are in an uncertain situation you don't have complete data and therefore you are still going to make a decision you can't wait for the data forever to forever and then take a decision yeah but you go back and what has got created you got a you got a retina uh, in your eye uh, and your vision is uh, not more than 40 50% and if i'm seeing you the retina catches only 40% of uh, rishikesh right the rest of the 50% is stored information in my brain the brain says i fill up the gaps and this is rishikesh wow that's that's what it is right so i mean ai works in a similar kind of principle you you have some pattern and then the rest gets filled up right so when you say therefore intuition that intuition ultimately is stored the data of many things that's why they say when you love somebody they appear more beautiful right because your brain is building the remaining 50% to make it probably look better than it quote unquote physically is right that is one level higher i'm saying even at a at a level lower the actual pixels that come out of rishikesh is not 100% right science tells you that Right. brain cannot wait for that brain fills up the balance how does artificial intelligence uh, detect a cat i mean you see all of this you know the 10 pictures and then and, and, uh, say you know what the animal there and, and then it says it's a dog or a cat because it fills up now therefore you got some stored data the intuition is stored data somewhere which you're pulling down right right and relevant data which you are pulling down to fill up the gaps that's what intuition is about so it is not uh, intuition versus data it is data that is apparent to you and the data which has been stored over experiences of the past because past is full of data and future is zero data but as i said the future is inside the the current it's now it's embedded so if i look at all the data i know what the future is going to be got it so just to summarize for the benefit of our viewers build a bedrock build a foundation with as much data as you can gather about the as a situation decide at least to begin with where you want to take the status quo so you want to transform the status quo from x to say maybe 10x and between x to 10x the steps to take you there are all partly instinct but partly your knowledge and experience over the years giving you subcutaneous levels of data like maybe secondary levels of data coming right. from experience absolutely which connect with data you already have on absolutely. the as is yeah. and lead you to a hypothesis absolutely. like a a possibility okay this may lead me there or right. this may lead us there correct exactly that but i think it's a, you know if i say that you need to have a long history of experience in this um, you know then you got to wait until you're very old to become an entrepreneur right yeah. no i think whatever you pick up which is your idea now or your curiosity leads you to something right an idea or something that you want to know about no intensely about it it could be a very narrow thing but no intensely about it 
And when you know intensely about it, you have enough data. That's all that's required. What would you do if you had to re- if you had to take a step back? I mean, if you're starting, if you were starting today, right, and you were the twenty something version of yourself, what would you tell that person, and what would you do maybe different? You know, I'm. I wish I were uh, twenty. I think it's like uh, every day I think so. I, <laughs> I think I, I really were twenty because I see very very exciting times ahead. Wow. Right? Because. Uh, I think uh, there is such a wonderful interplay of uh, uh, technology on the one hand, uh, the social dynamics on the other hand, uh, and all the ecosystem trying to support you in terms of uh, the changes that you wish to make. Uh, so it's a very interesting time to be a young man of twenty. Uh, what will I do now? Uh, I think, as I said, you know, future is not going to be a slow linear thing. It's going to be much faster, right? Uh, and to some extent, in a little bit of contradiction to what I said so far, that it's all about data and, and the seed is uh, embedded. You got to look at the future. What is called now discontinuous kind of future is not going to be discontinuous that much. There is some seed here, but I would look for that spark more carefully than I looked for in the past. I think that change, the seed of the change that you see today, I would look for that beneath the haystack and try and find the needle. Hmm. That I think is the is the skill that I would say you need today. But it's probably also come. There's a, there's a wonderful book called The Gain and the Gap. Right. So most of us look at the gap between where we are and where we want to be. But this book advocates that you look at the gain you have made vis-a-vis where you were. So I think a lot of what you are saying, you would tell your twenty-something version, is coming from the gain you have made over decades of experience. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Yes. Not, not something not too many people know about is the fact that you are also an author and you have written books on subjects which have again nothing to do with your, you know, rich manufacturing expertise and also in your uh, stint as the chairman of Infosys, but it's on something completely different. So. I uh, would love to hear more about that. Yeah, well, I took to fiction. Uh, I wrote my first book when I was uh, 75. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that might sound uh, funny. And uh, the reason why I wrote uh, that book, uh, which is a novel, and I've since been writing in Tamil also, uh, writing short stories in Tamil. The reason why I wanted to uh, write uh, fiction was because uh, I felt that uh, there's so many things around you. On which you have an opinion, right? That opinion you can either express in terms of a very uh, well argued uh, case, uh, a prose uh, in an essay, or you could have a parable, hmm. which gives you the same uh, message. Uh, you find that uh, parables have been very, very beautifully deployed by many, many religious leaders. Practically every religion there's a parable, because reaches the message reaches through a exactly. parable much more impactfully. Uh, so I wanted to just uh, and it, I, not because uh, I have any ideas that I'm going to be a you know big literary figure or anything like that. Not at all. Um, I wanted to express my view. I wanted to say that this is the viewpoint that I have about this particular uh, social issue, and I wanted to say that in the form of a story. That's what I've been doing. So, if you could just maybe spend a minute telling us about what that story was about. Well, the novel, you mean? The novel, yes. Yeah, the the novel is about uh, uh, a Muslim boy who is born in a very conservative uh, Muslim family in Tamil Nadu, uh, who uh, wants to learn Bharatanatyam, and he he sees a few dance pieces in movies, and then he watches a Bharatanatyam recital. Uh, and then he is uh, completely enamored, and he wants to learn Bharatanatyam, and he is thrown out uh, for attempting to do that uh, by his house, which is conservative. Uh, and this is uh, in the set again in the 70s and 80s when the male dances uh, were not uh, common common in Bharatanatyam. Uh, but he wants to pursue that, and so he runs away from home, uh, gets a teacher here. And then 
has many obstacles because Bharatanatyam is considered to be uh, owned uh, or identified, if not owned, identified with uh, the Hindu religion. Uh, and therefore, uh, the obstacles of a Muslim boy wanting to do that, uh, there is this question, uh, is Bharatanatyam uh, a form of a worship and therefore you get onto the stage, are you actually emoting the, the, the emotions of a bhakta and therefore is it an offering to the Lord and how can you have a Muslim boy do that? Uh, so those kind of questions uh, have been asked. Uh, and my thrust of that is to say that it doesn't matter uh, you know, which religion you belong to. Uh, if you can, if you love an art form and if you can convey through the art form uh, what you want to convey uh, and in a creative fashion, uh, you should not have any boundaries in this. So, in other words, uh, my belief, I'm, I'm a liberal and I don't have any compunctions and uh, hesitation saying that. Uh, and as a liberal, I do think that uh, there must be fluidity of uh, art and literature and language amongst the religions. No, that's brilliant. In fact, I happen to have read the book and one of the things which would be useful to entrepreneurs as well is the way in which the protagonist actually sort of immerses himself in the dance and then loses context in a way of the world around and he sort of becomes the dance. The, da the dance becomes him and he becomes the dance. Sure. In a way, that's what every entrepreneur needs to do. They have to really immerse themselves in the business. Uh, and I think it really spoke to your own journey right? as someone who ran and managed businesses. I think that was also the, so you were more reflecting your own personal journey in the book, but using the protagonist, Zakir, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think uh, I would say that. Uh, in fact, uh, no, I had, uh, I would have a very uh, different story if I had to uh, do this around me. Uh, but it is my belief. It is one of my beliefs in this context. Understood. So there's a link to the book in the description. Uh, so anybody who wants to check out the book, it is a fabulously well-written book. And again, an example of your very diverse and very interesting life. So once again, thank you so much. It was uh, an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure this will reach hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people and impact all of their lives. So once again, sir, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.